Hello, all you cool cats and kittens. This is Overpriced JPEGs. I'm Carly Riley. And on today's episode of the show, we have Klon, the artist behind Cool Cats. And uh, I did, in fact, ask Klon whether or not Carol Baskin, the famous <laughs> real life character from Tiger King, who is famous for saying, hello, all you cool cats and kittens, if she was in any way the inspiration for the name Cool Cats. And he answers me. So listen to this episode to find out. Claude and I talked about a whole bunch of stuff. It was so great to get to know, essentially, the artist behind this massive phenomenon. Uh, we talked about how Claude got started in NFTs, how he came up with the idea for Cool Cats, uh, how he prepared for launching this. If you are an artist, if you are somebody who's been interested in launching your own NFT collection, I think you absolutely should listen to this episode and learn from how Klon did it. We also talked about what NFTs he's been buying these days, and he shares what a day in his life looks like now that he's a very successful NFT artist. So that's all coming up. But first, a word from our sponsors. Everyone is talking about the metaverse these days, and we're all still trying to figure out what it actually is, because everyone is looking for how to get exposure to it. That is why a metaverse index fund is so important, because in such a young market, an index can give you broad exposure to all the various players who are building out all these digital worlds that will ultimately become the metaverse. And that's why you should check out the metaverse index from the Index Co-op. The metaverse index gives you simple, easy, and safe one-click exposure to the emerging open metaverse trend. The MVI index contains some of the biggest metaverse projects out there, including Axie Infinity, Decentraland, Alluvium, and more. So join thousands of holders who have already trusted nearly $50 million to the MVI index. And if you buy $500 of MVI on the Dharma app, you can receive $50 worth of ETH on the Polygon network. There's a link in the show notes for you to click so you can get started on your journey into the metaverse. Onjuno is your new crypto-enabled financial services company. Onjuno lets you get your direct deposit paycheck paid to you in crypto. Set up your direct deposit with Onjuno and receive part of your paycheck in your preferred crypto asset, reducing the time that you're holding on to your inflating dollars. The best thing is Onjuno sends your crypto directly to your own wallet, whether it's your ledger, your MetaMask, or however you hold your crypto. Onjuno can also be a checking account for your crypto, where you manage both your cash and your crypto from one simple account. It's free and opening up an account with Onjuno comes with a metal debit card that gives you 5% cash back at select businesses, including Uber, Starbucks, Walmart, Target, and other Web2 companies. Use code BANKLESS when you create your Onjuno account and our friends at Juno will airdrop you $50 in ETH when you set up your first crypto paycheck. Sign up at onjuno.com slash crypto to get started. That's O-N-J-U-N-O dot com slash crypto. All right. Hello, Klon. Welcome to Overpriced JPEGs. I'm so incredibly excited to have you on this show, grateful to have you on this show. When we launched this show, uh, Cool Cats was one of the very first projects I wanted to talk to because I think you're such an interesting story. You've blown up so much, and I, and I really wanted to hear direct from the horse's mouth how this journey has been, how this all happened, and I know there's a lot of people out there who want to understand the same. So thank you so, so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. And uh, it's been a crazy ride, a crazy journey to get Cool Cats to where it is. And it sort of all started with me just doodling on a piece of paper and just keeping at it until NFTs came about. And that was where I went with the character. So let's talk about that. I guess we should say, and maybe this is obvious, but you were the artist behind Cool Cats. So yeah, you've, yeah, you've yeah. drawn all the Cool Cats. So start us, like, when did you start making art? Tell us your background and, and what was that journey from you're an artist and then you discover NFTs? How did that, how did that go? Yeah, because, I mean, for a while, I had been looking at NFTs from the outskirts and just like many people, didn't understand it. Didn't understand when was this? How. When did you this first was... hear the term NFT, but you're like, what is this? Probably 2020, okay. but like I didn't research anything. Mm -hmm. I was just like, I heard the word NFT, figured out that it stood for non-fungible token. And I was like, this has something to do with crypto. I only kind of know crypto. I'm going to stay out. Yeah. And like that, <laughs> a bunch and of libertarians of doing weird things, trying to take down the banking system. No, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Like what's going on here? What's yeah, the yeah. internet on? Um, yeah. <laughs> and so, so that's how it was. And I had always been drawing like I said, and but one day, uh, my friend Evan, aka Elu, another co-founder of 
Cool Cats, he actually brought me on to a different project um, as a motion designer because that's what I did professionally before this. And I was just creating digital content for him. That's all it was. I got immersed into the NFT space through doing this. And that's kind of how I learned about it. And so I was learning about like Bored Apes because they had just released. And so now we're in 2021. Now like you've been doing this work. We're in 2021 and you're starting to be like, oh, okay. And things are starting to pop. Okay. And to clarify, all of my crypto experience is in 2021. Um, Mm -hmm. I officially started my crypto journey in February when I like started investing in in ETH more and a little bit of Bitcoin. Um, So I'd, I'd kind of been saving that up as well just as like a second savings account for myself because I started to understand it. I was like, oh, this is a cool global decentralized uh, currency and that you can do so much with that. So what was your aha it, moment for NFTs? Was it was it Bored Apes or do you, did you have a moment where you were suddenly like, oh, oh, my God, like I get what this is now? It on, Honestly, it didn't. Because I and I understand Bored Apes now, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> At the time, I was like, I don't get it. I don't understand mm. why people would pay this much for this image. Uh, because I was also coming from it from an art art standpoint. That's like, I'd pay this for like digital like art, like a one-off, like a complete mm-hmm. one-off kind of thing. Um, but I was only looking at it from the art standpoint mm-hmm. and not that this is literally a token. Like at the end of the day, a lot of people will strip away the, the visual and only see it as a token. Um, and because you can make money off of it. And it's, I guess when it really clicked with me was like, oh, you're investing in the project, the like kind of IP of it. It's no different than buying a stock in a company. Like that's what you're doing. Mm-hmm. You're buying it so that you believe in it. Don't tell the SEC you'll... that you're a cool cat yeah. about to get slapped with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some so, sort of security. No, I'm just kidding. Right, 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 right. But like that's how you could kind of like understand it if you had yep. any idea of the of the market. And so um, it really clicked with me, I guess, with at Board Apes as well, but a few other projects. None really off the top of my head. Because it was funny, the NFT space was so different back then. Uh, people were doing bonding curves and like it wasn't all about PFP projects um, and things like that. So um, back to when I was working with Evan when on that project, he we were doing that, whatever. Um, and then long story short, our, our dev fell through and like completely rugged mm. us and was like, I'm not helping you anymore. And so we're back at square one and we're just like, uh, what do we do? We need to go find developers. And through that whole process, like even before that developer said I'm out, um, I invested in another NFT called Faticorns. And I was talking to the devs there. We were getting close. Um, Turns out that's Tom and Link, the other two co-founders of Cool Cats. So that's all how we all met was through their project. Um, and they didn't want to help us with the project that Evan and I were working on because they didn't want, Tom literally said, I don't want to destroy your project. Uh, (laughs) what was that project? Uh, I don't want to say it because it hasn't been publicly said yet. Um, but, and that's the only reason, but so he didn't want to help with that. And then Evan and I are like really depressed the next two days. Like, what are we going to do with this project? We just spent like weeks and weeks and weeks developing or like designing and stuff and And now we don't have a dev and yeah yeah. now we don't have a dev i was going to point at the the poster in the background but i'm laying on my there used to be a couch here um i was laying on the couch and looking up and i see this poster this old uh the cat tunis poster the work i did before cool cats um and it was blue cat but in a bunch of different outfits and just like stacked on top of each other and there's probably like 50 of them and I was like, wait a minute. I've had this character just sitting here right in front of me this whole time. And look at Bored Apes. They have this like generative costume thing going on. What if we just did our, our take on that? And it boom hit me. And then I just went wild, like just sketching and sketching and sketching. And I was like, let's call them cool cats. Um, and this was just between Evan and I. And then we go to Tom and Link and we're like, hey, we don't want you to help with our old project. 
we have this new project and we think it's going to be a hit. Um, and then from there, we all like as a team, equal parts, like started Cool Cats together. Wow. Um, and then so let me yeah. let me ask a silly question. You you said the name Cool Cats kind of hit you, or you and Evan decided together on that. Did that have anything to do with Tiger King? No. Like, hey, nothing. you cool cats and kittens. Like, it's as funny. I was researching I for this, I was like, oh, I wonder if there was from? anything there because Tiger yeah. King was such a, you know, 2020, this kind of yeah, general era absolutely. thing. I but still no. have never seen it. So, <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, so okay. definitely no. I was definitely not. not. But it kind of hit me because, um, like I said, the cartoonist was my Instagram account before Cool Cats. Um, where I had always been drawing the character, yada, yada, yada. The point of me telling you this is I always hated the word, the name, the cartoonist, the further mm. I got along, because so many people either called it the cartoonist, the cartoonist, mm. they just didn't even see the play on words, or they just misspell it. And that's nobody's fault. It's just a confusing word. And so I was thinking of the names for, for Cool Cats, and I was like, well, cool is a word anyone in the world probably knows and cat and it's just and it's already a phrase people use like oh you're a cool cat um so it just felt like a no-brainer to me um and um again it my analogy or not analogy my example is like if you're at a party and the music's blasting and you're trying to tell someone your name of the project it's like cool cats you're gonna hear that Oh, it's easy. Ca- it's easy at a loud tunis. party. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And just any situation like that, you know, you can tell someone it and they could spell it. And that's important to me. Um, it's not confusing at all. That's fascinating. So I want to actually talk about what your your strategic thinking was in advance of launching. But let's, again, orient ourselves time-wise here. So you and Evan approach Tom and Link and you're like, hey, okay, we've got this other project idea. They're now like, oh, these are some cool cats. We're in. Yeah. Where are we in 2021 and how how long was it between that conversation and then launching? So that conversation probably happened around May 19th. Okay. And now, we, give or take, not to be too specific. Give or take. <laughs> yeah, well, I have it written in a notebook like May 19th and I that's kind of what cool. I've been going off of. Okay. Um and so we started there and a lot of like the first week was just brainstorming and like our, our what action we're going to take and at this time I'm also like drawing the character but in like a like template way um, and then we have something there and we're kind of going with it and Tom uh, and Link are just such geniuses in the developer space like we're thinking like oh how do we add rarities into this like what crazy things that we can do um, and so from like that may range to july 1st our launch date like was just pure development and i don't know how it was for them but for me i i was a freelance graphic designer and for a while my my clients kind of just went under the radar so it was Mm -hmm. this perfect time where i had all the time in the world and i just went all in on making these assets and um you know i would draw a bunch of little hats whatever shirts faces throw them over to tom he would put them in a bunch of code and it would just like you could just spit out a hundred in like a second and we'd like go through all of them and that's how we'd look at them did you think about this as a brand at that point where you like we're about to go build a brand and an intellectual property brand was that in your mind at that point leading up to launch i guess yes because with Blue Cat, the character, it's always been a brand for me. I've always been trying to make that a brand. Uh, just this one little blue character and then his friends. Uh, so, but then with Cool Cats, yeah, because we were taking that step into like, I felt like we were, it was a rebirth of the character. Um, I'm curious if you did any like branding or traditional, what people would think of as like traditional branding exercises. And and what I'm asking here is I, I interviewed Betty NFT from Dead Fellas and sort of off the cuff based on the conversation, I asked her which Harry Potter house Dead Fellas would be in. And she said yeah. Slytherin. And, and then it actually struck me that's kind of an interesting, almost like branding exercise of like, yeah. this is the intention behind the character. In? Like what house are you in? So A, what, what house would Cool Cats be in? I but think we'd B, be Gryffindor. Yeah, yeah. Or Hufflepuff be, maybe. Or Hufflepuff. Yeah, 
For sure, for sure, for sure. Bo- both could fit. But did you think, probably not about which Harry Potter house it would be in, but ha- did you think about, okay, what's the what's the culture we want to create here? Ah, what does our brand yeah, yeah, stand yeah. for? Like some of that for traditional sure. brand thinking work in that time. Um, there's actually a, it, this kind. This doesn't quite answer your question, but uh, and this won't show up in the, the live stream, but I had this sticky note. Actually, oh, wow. this is... Anyways, it was a scale. It's scales it says, of justice, kind of. If you're if you're listening in the podcast, yeah, scales of justice. Thank you. Let's visualize this. Scales yeah, yeah. of justice, and on one side it says cool, and on the other side it says cute, and it's it's this balancing huh. act where I need it to be both cute and cool, but it needs to be a little bit cooler than cute. Um, and that was my like. I know it's so simple, but that's no, what was that's, running through my brain. I think the that's whole important. Time. And, yeah. and because I know a lot of people who listen to this show are interested in maybe doing their own project one day, like having people realize the kind of thoughtfulness that gets put into these projects that I think end up being successful is so valuable. What, do, are there any couple of things you could point to that were decisions you made to make it cool? Like what were the what were the cool decisions to like help boost the cool? If you well, if you have it's certain around traits. That? It was like certain mm. traits I'd come out with. Um, yeah, you know, you're like cowboy trait. That was like cooler or <laughs> something like that versus like a flower in the hair, which was cute, mm. you know, because we needed to have both. And it wasn't like I was trying to make traits that were for females. I was trying to make traits that were either feminine or masculine and kind of everything in between so that it didn't feel like Blue Cat was being gendered in any way. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes you'll hear me call Blue Cat him and that's just how it's been. But like. I love when someone finds their forever cat and they call like, oh, she's so cute. And I'm like, that's what I want. I want you to say whatever you want kind of thing. Yeah. Um, And that's kind of the going back to your other question of like the what audience or whatever we were looking for. um, It was actually Tom who really spearheaded the idea of like, let's go all in on being family friendly. Like as uh, founders, let's not like cuss anywhere. You know, our, none of our cats are smoking, drinking beer, none of that. And that's because um, it's already so playful and friendly that we just doubled down on it. And what we found was there's a lot of people with kids who now can sh- introduce NFTs to their kids through cool cats because mm-hmm. it's a safe bet. They're not worried about it being it's like G rated, you know, and so they can show their kids and it'd be fine. Um and that's helped out a lot. And a lot of people have told us their stories of like, it's fun that I can do NFTs with my kids and they can kind of understand it. Um, and that was just big. And so we've really gone like extra fur- like further with that after hearing all these stories. Um, yeah. So that's kind of the audience. And so you had that idea in mind even before you launched this family friendly idea and then and then. You had and then the it really was apparent, like after the fact, and that's oh no we, pun intended apparent. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so you launch in July, and was it successful right out the gate? Like in the in the first day, you sold out quickly. Was it? Did it have all the makings of that kind of? We had a weird launch project? day in in the best way possible. It was a weird launch date where we came out of the gates with a point zero six. Um, Ethereum price, which at the time was like $150. And uh, you just got one cat for that. You minted it and you instantly saw it. And we initially had a lot of sales, but it only got to like 300 out of the 10,000. And you could see that it kind of just plateaued. And it were just like some sales coming in. And then there was uh, a user that came into our Discord and was like, hey, I'm ready to buy a bunch of these if you're to lower your price. Uh, And then everyone in our Discord was like, oh my gosh, yes, we'll we'll buy even more if you do this. And so we switched it from 0.06 to 0.02, which was like 50 bucks. And um, we sold out in the next six hours. It's like, it just kind of took to Twitter. And then everyone's like, wait a minute, this, these people aren't like cash grabbing. They just like want their thing out there. And so it sold out. And because of that, we had a lot of people who didn't have a lot of money and only bought one. And they're still holding that one. Um, or or they flipped it a bunch of times and now have made more, uh, got more money and 
more cats or whatever. But it was just cool because we let in this bigger audience. And because of that, this community got formed because it was just a lot of different people, not just people who had a lot of money in their wallets. And so it created this really positive space. So for that everyone. decision, it sounds like, are you crediting that decision in part with then kind of launching the community in a certain way and setting the tone for what the community was? In a way, yeah. Like the art definitely, definitely lends itself to that. And us as a team, because another thing you didn't see often in the space was the devs, like the founders of the team were talking to you. Because usually there's this veil of like, we're, we're the founders of the team, mm -hmm. you're buying our thing, we're gonna like only feed you information when it's important versus us where we're sitting in Discord every day. Like, you have a question, we'll answer it. Like, we're here for you. Um, no, an no question is dumb kind of thing. Because this is a confusing space and it's really easy to get scammed or do one thing wrong and you lose a thousand dollars or something. So, so that we're decision there. Yeah. was huge. I'm curious though, because there are so many people who want what you have, right? And want to launch a project <laughs> and have it sell out in 24 hours, even if, you know, there's a plateau period. Right. What else do you think you guys had done right in, in terms of building a community or where you got lucky or, or what were the factors that you think allowed for you to sell anything on that first day when you launched the project? Right. So funny enough, uh, our marketing wasn't the best. People didn't really know about us. So it's not just marketing that's uh, can like make or break you. But um, I think we got lucky with dropping our price. It just that bit of news like hit the fan. And it was just a bunch of people who never knew about the project because our marketing was like whatever. And so um, I think what audiences really attach themselves to is like, in our case, art that was friendly. So like, it, and that really went a long way. It's hard to explain, but then like, just a community of people who are literally willing to help each other at any cost. Like we're in it together kind of thing. And because of that, now months later, there's a lot of people who were in our community that have now started their own project because mm -hmm. they met through Cool Cats. Um, and that sort of thing is just so crazy to me that communities like this can uh, can form. And then like a new project comes out and we all show interest in it. And like the cats as a whole, like move to this other project <laughs> and like invest in it and whatever and start more communities. And it's this like web that's growing. Um, it's really cool. We're all, like I said, willing to help each other. Do you um, feel like at the time you were filling a gap in the market where there wasn't maybe this, because I think of now, I think of a lot of, there are a lot of, call it cute projects, but this cute, cool balance. Do you feel like at the moment you guys launched, you were filling a gap and, and that was part yeah. of what you said, people resonating with the art and that's something, you know, how can you do something different or innovative or see what's not in the market at the moment and, and Absolutely. try and deliver that? Yeah. And we didn't really know that's what we were doing at the time. Uh, but it, it hit us after the fact and people have told us was like there was nothing cute on the market. Mm -hmm. Just straight up nothing cute existed on the blockchain. It was all for like, I hate to say this or generalize, it's all for like the bros in the space that were like, they want laser eyes, they want it smoking <laughs> a cigarette, they want it like hardcore looking. And that's how m the majority of them were. Um, Super Yetis had come out and that was kind of leaning towards like a little bit cuter. Apparently their metadata, whatever, didn't work so well. I was a little late to that, so I don't know too much. But anyways, like we came out with this like cartoon style, like cute, very easy to understand. And even through the cartoonists, one thing I've always said is people gravitate towards cartoons more because it's just like more welcoming. I don't know. Uh, that's and just cats, how I've I interviewed cats, Max Flavel. Yeah. I, I interviewed Max Flavel. That that episode is airing this week. Actually, he came up with the idea for Crypto Kitties, and he back in the day, and he was like, I had been in like consumer goods products for years, and I'd learned that cats were opt out, not opt in. Like if you were making yeah. a consumer product, yeah. <laughs> you had yes. to justify why you weren't making it a cat, not cat. why you were making it a cat. Yes, absolutely. So you, you, you hit that well. Um, well, and there was also like other cat projects out there. And so we were worried that we were just going to be one of the other ones. So that was But they also, weren't cute enough. They weren't cute like. enough. <laughs> they weren't cute enough. Exactly. You said... <laughs> You said your marketing wasn't great 
leading up to launch. Mm-hmm. Why was that? What do you think you guys could have done better? I don't know. <laughs> I, huh. I, I felt like we were creating like decent content. Um, I think, oh, actually, I do know where we went wrong. And it's because none of us were thinking about it. We needed to get onto like Twitter spaces or Clubhouse mm-hmm. and just be talking because we were kind of under the radar just posting like promo videos and stuff, which I thought were good um, and thought that that would be enough or just like interacting with people on Twitter. But it didn't get enough reach. And I think I realized that post launch when we did get on Twitter spaces and we just kept getting more people, more eyes on us um, because you have someone like like the first one we went on was with Farouk on Clubhouse. And then now there's this whole other audience of people who never knew about you. And now they know about you. Did you think, do you think going on Farouk would have been possible for you all before you launched though? Or was that something that became possible because you sold out a project? I think it was, became possible for us. And that's the difficulties is like, how do you squeeze yourself in to get noticed? Or does the artwork itself speak for, you know, I don't know. Um, it's tough. It's definitely, this has been in the art world for years and years and years. It's unfortunately, sometimes who do you know? And that's mm-hmm. how marketing can can be better is who do you know? I think we'll, we'll definitely circle back to that because I want to do a whole section here where I hear your thoughts for artists who are trying to get into this space and artists in general. So putting a pin in that, you said something interesting, which is you feel like part of your success was because the team was so accessible and was in the Mm -hmm. discord and was chatting with folks. And as I've been thinking about this space in general, one thing that maybe makes me nervous is that projects are really dependent on their founding team. You made the comparison to the stock market, but like Mm -hmm. if Coca-Cola the CEO of Coca-Cola says he's going to step down or she's going to step down. Like maybe that impacts the stock price, you know, people like her or whatever, but yeah, nobody's freaking out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. There'll be it'll another CEO. Going. Coke and it'll is not going nowhere. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like it, this is not a death blow. You know, when founders of a project leave, it's called a rug pull, you know, <laughs> like, yes. and, and yeah. partly if that's a joke is it, you know, you can have a founder who leaves in an honorable way versus a non-honorable way. But right, right, right. I'm curious if you think that we are in a stage right now with NFTs and, and how you think about cool cats where, they're still very dependent on the founders themselves, mm-hmm. you know, and, and if that makes you nervous and if you think that'll change in 10 years, if it's an established enough brand or how you think about that central importance of the founding team. Um, yeah. Well, and I think for us, you know, we're all very, very, very passionate about we're we all have achieved our, what we think is like a dream job. And so we're in it for the long run. But that's obviously not every project. And like, with cool cats the reason we want to be the reason we hold a town hall meeting every friday even though sometimes i'd love to have my friday but uh it's because we want to talk to you and make sure you know like we're still working on this our like we're not going anywhere we're not just gonna leave one day because we have kind of seen that sometimes where the project doesn't do well and then it just fizzles out And it sucks Mm -hmm. because a lot of people invested money in that and now they feel cheated. So for Cool Cats, we just try to make sure that you know, like, no matter where this graph is going, like, we're in it for the long run and we're Mm -hmm. gonna keep going. Um, So if you believe in the project, like, thank you. Let me suggest a way I see this playing out in the space kind of in general, but I use Cool Cats as an example. And tell me if it resonates for you, if you're like, yeah, that feels right to me. Mm -hmm. I think what we're still in this very nascent stage in NFTs. So the founding teams are really, really important. Mm-hmm. I I used to be sort of a student of Warren Buffett. I worked at a hedge fund that like did everything based on <laughs> like how Warren Buffett saw yeah. investing. And uh, Warren Buffett has a very funny quote that is, a ham sandwich could run Coca-Cola. And his, <laughs> his point there, and, and he actually has another line that's like invest in companies that even an idiot could run because eventually an idiot will, right? Like his whole thing is you want right. brands that have such a strong moat that mm-hmm. it almost doesn't matter who's in charge because the moat of the brand is really strong. So it seems like where we are in the NFT stage right now is that all these brands are, are so nascent that they're still very dependent on the founding teams and the the kind of myth and cult following of the founding teams in, in the best sense of the yeah. word. Mm-hmm. But that the goal for a project like yours is to build an intellectual property that becomes so sort of recognizable that eventually it can be somewhat separated, at least in the mainstream 
from the founding team, right? And so in yeah. 30 years, if you wanted to retire, you know, whatever, right. yeah. y- you have a brand that can now stand on its own. Is, would Absolutely. that be how you would describe maybe your goal, yeah. you know, for, 100%. for the project? Yeah, that's, that's exactly how I see our goal. Like, our goals is to be a Hello Kitty of the blockchain, mm. is to be so big that you're going to see Blue Cat's face slapped on everything. And that's why, like, um, the IP is so important to us is because it's not just an a- it's not just a cat it's a character of a cat and so it's a character that has personality and a brand uh, literally a brand formed around it and we want that everywhere and so that's kind of the long like, and we're going to do that through different ways whether it be like a video game TV show books like you know we're just trying to get into uh, the real world too because I don't think you should just stop at NFTs. I think there's a bigger picture here. Um, and we we have to get into the people who don't want to get into NFTs. But now you have this, this launch pad because of NFTs to get into other people's eyes. Um, and so whether that be through, like I said, merch or TV shows, video games, whatever. Um, man, Are you I'm, having conversations, I'm assuming, with, I don't know, studios or like these... IRL, you know, right. people well, and abs- brands about partnerships and collaborations and building yeah. shows and not to be too specific about anything. I right, right. Have a and lot I'll of stay types. vague about it. Um, but for sure, like we're we're having these conversations. We're like, Cool Cats is in it for the long run. We're thinking not just right now in the NFT space of where the blockchain and Web3 is going to end up and how are we going to still be there kind of thing. And so by talking to different companies and whatever, it's, you're just solidifying yourself as a brand because like when Time Magazine came in, that was a massive deal because it's like, whoa, this company that's been around for 100 years, like recognized our brand as, and said, we want to work with you. And, you know, obviously that was great for Cool Cats, but it was great for the space in general because it's also mm-hmm. validating NFTs and that this is, we have something here. And um, Time and Keith Grossman approached you for that deal. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And it's funny because I read about this and it seems like the family friendly element was actually what Keith was was drawn to. Is that right? Yeah. Is that like that yeah. ended up being why they approached you and, and how that came together? Absolutely. And that, like I said, that's why we doubled down on being family friendly is because we're going to see bigger brands coming into the space. And are they going to want to take a risky bet with something that, you know, could rub people the wrong way or the safe bet that's family friendly Mm. you can show your children and it goes back to that scale of cute and cool like we want to make sure it's you know cute enough for kids but cool enough for adults and that is the scale what is your pitch to these call it brands or studios or whatever you know you're on the phone like hey work with cool cats what what is that pitch like Oh, we tell them about the IP. We tell them about our community because I think that's extremely important. We have people who are ready to like stand with us. And I think that's a hard thing for any company to establish. Um, and so and do we, they get we, it? Do, brand, do you find people are getting it immediately when you or is yeah. there like an explaining the blockchain process or are people so hungry to like work Whoa. with NFTs because it's so hot that they're like, yes, <laughs> teach yeah. us your ways. Like we'll do anything. It's a little bit of both. Some people come into it knowing about the blockchain. Other people are coming to us because they're trying to get into the blockchain. And they're are going through us is kind of their route to getting like onboarded, I guess. So And you all yeah. recently hired a biz dev person. Is it Pete? Yes. Pete? We got Pete. Yeah. We are and we're hiring more people in general. Uh we've I was like gonna ask expanding. how big is your team now? And oh gosh. It's gotten actually kind of big. Um I think we have around like 15 people now and it started with four. Um, I could be exaggerating that number uh, because there's some people who are like on the team but are more like use case. But Pete is great. He has helped. They're all because we were wearing so many hats at first when it launched and it was just the four founders. Um, That's like I can't answer emails anymore if I (laughs) want to draw like I can't do X, Y, Z. Uh, and so we've been hiring people on. And like I said, our marketing kind of uh, wasn't the greatest at the beginning. So we hired uh, one of the community members that had been in the community almost since launch. And she 
always was trying to like promote the brand, do anything she could to help. And then eventually we're like, well, you're crushing it on Twitter. Do you want to just be paid for it mm. kind of thing? And it was like, yes. And so we're constantly trying to bring in people from our community because they obviously like the brand and they understand the space. Um, and it's helped out immensely. It's like, it's funny, the, you grow your team and you slow down a little bit, but in the long run, you speed up exponentially. And so that's kind of where we're at. You you all made the decision, I think early on or from, from launch point that 20% of all you know, ETH that came in would go into a treasury that would be given back to the community. Mm-hmm. I have that number right. Is that correct? Yes. It's the 20%? Although it was 20% of the initial sales. Oh, 20% the, of the initial sales, not yeah. an ongoing basis. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm curious. But we kind of do still kind of feed into that, just not like an exact 20%. It's kind of like a, oh, we did this charity piece or or a piece that's directly going into the community wallet and things like that. And that's how we kind of compensate and keep filling it up. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm curious how you think about, because your, your community is really strong and that's obviously a huge part, if not the core to your success. How do you think about these day-to-day community management activities with this longer term brand building and balancing that? And do you think of those as two separate work streams? Are you all working on both all the time? How do you, how do you approach that? Yeah, well, the brand is like, Kind of something I guess I had already established before Cool Cats, and it's now like making sure that that gets executed. Um, do you mind repeating the question? I think I missed out on one aspect of it, and I was no just problem. about to ramble. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate you your honesty. You know, I was yeah. asking um, how you think about the balance between long term brand building, so some of this ah. biz dev stuff we're talking about, and part- partnerships and, and all of that, with day to day keeping the community engaged giving 20% back to them with giveaways, et cetera. Like, are yeah. these two separate work streams? Do you work on both? Are, you know, do you have separate, you know, I, plans when you look ahead? Yeah. How does that work? Oh, well, we try to do both at the same time. But that was another reason we brought on, like, more moderators into the space is because, unfortunately, I can't spend as much time in Discord if, if I want to keep the brand going, you know? It's like this trade off of, like, do I want to talk to everyone or do I want to help out the project that they're mm-hmm. invested in? Um, <clears throat> and so it's definitely a balancing act of we as founders are having our talks of like the bigger picture stuff. And then we're kind of relaying that down to people and working with them still. Like we're still doing those things, but they're helping us like make sure we execute them um, and getting to the the finish line that we want to of the Mm -hmm. brand and where we all kind of see the bigger picture of it and it's crazy because some things could take like like there's things we have in the in the works that are you're not going to see until later next year kind of thing and those are like the bigger things but then you have to come up with the smaller things like oh it's christmas time how are we going to do like christmas themed things and keeping your community engaged because you can't just within this space, like you have to keep fueling your community or else you're going to get forgotten about. Um, so yeah, it's a weird balancing act and it's really, it's really difficult. Uh, so. You all grew from a mint price, I guess, really of 0.02 because so yeah. you dropped it to at one point hitting a 10 ETH floor. Now, yeah. I'm not somebody who advocates like tracking a floor like crazy. I think you should invest for the long term, but you know, still, heck, that's, <laughs> that's, a a, that's crazy growth. Yeah. Um, why is a cool cat worth 10 ETH? <laughs> Why is a cool cat worth 10 ETH? So to break it down, for especially for anyone listening that has no idea how these JPEGs cost so much, um, the best way I put it is it's a collector's item and it's a token as well. So it's like, yes, it's a visual, it's a picture of a cat, but it's also a currency. It's no different than Ethereum or Bitcoin, you know, but now it's visual. Um, but it's all tied around the company. And so, you know, it, how well the company does, et cetera. So because there's only 10,000 of them, the more people who find their forever cats or are just, as we say, diamond handing it and holding them on so tightly and never giving them up that the scarcity goes down. And so it's like, well, do you... The scarcity you know, goes up. Oh, sorry. Scarcity more scarce, goes up. Scarce. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I'm always... I, <laughs> 
<laughs> the double get, negatives. Yeah, and double negatives. You know. I always get those wrong. And so because of that, because of the scarcity going up, we it it gets harder to get into the project because people aren't willing to sell them. And so some people, you know, when it gets up to the 10th floor, everyone's like, well, I'm not selling it for under that. So if you want to get in on this project to get into the community events, to feel like you have ownership in it, or just to simply have a, a cat that you really relate to, um, that's how the price goes up. And it just fluctuates with where people think the price should be, or if they're just trying to get, as we call liquid, just get your money back. Um, and things like that. And then the crazier thing here, which I didn't really grasp in the NFT space, was people are looking for digital identities. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people have gotten a cool cat and made an entire brand around that. And the best example of that is Andrew Wang, who uh, is a journalist, and he bought the Upside Down cat. And that was like a big story at the time because he spent five ETH on it. Um, but it, he had like a whole story about it and definitely research that. It's a lot of, it's an interesting story. And through it, Andrew found a community, he found friends, and he found a voice. And that all was around this cat that he bought. And so if you ever see an upside down cat, that's Andrew. Like ever, just even referenced anywhere, it's Andrew's cat or something that's upside down. And so like people make brands off of it too. And yeah. uh, that's- You've built an umbrella value. brand that people have clearly responded to and clearly resonate with. Mm -hmm. And when you're able to kind of command a community like that, you know, that's the thousand true fan theory, right? Or yeah. like, you know, when yeah. you're able to command a number of people who feel really bought into sort of the feel and the brand that you've created, that's a very powerful thing. And, and NFTs yeah. are doing it in a unique way. Um, yeah. And you guys and have done it weird. incredibly well. It's weird when prices get up that high. Like even <laughs> I have to like take a double, double like, take. take and just be like, what? And I remember I was leaving my, this is a separate story, tangent, but I was leaving my job after the launch and I was trying to tell my employer or my, my client at the time, I'm like, hey, I, I'm leaving to go do this full time. Uh, and he's like, wait, explain this to me. I'm like, all right, here, this thing sold out. Like, these are a bunch of cats I drew, yada, yada, yada. And I laughed with him, but he's like, this? You just sold a bunch of cats <laughs> like this? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, I don't get it. And I'm like, it's okay. Not a lot of people do, but it's, uh, it's a currency. And that's how you have to see it. Um, it's weird. <laughs> I want to talk about ownership rights and, and derivative projects, mm -hmm. because I think this is a, a battle that the space is going to face in general for a while. Yeah. There was recently kind of resurfaced the crypto punks, crypto funks thing. Yeah. And I think Cool Cats recently had to deal with this. You, yeah. you all had a Medium post that talked about your your where you guys stood on copyrights. And, and if I may summarize this briefly, it was like, if you own a cat, you can do anything you want with that cat. With that cat, yeah. But you can't come at our project and like rip off Mm -hmm. all of the cats and rip off its project in the entirety. I think where there was recently some confusion was yes. in that original blog post, it sort of sounded like, but hey, we're not going to go at, it's not worth our time to go after rip off projects. Right. Mm -hmm. And then recently, I think uh, Lil Baby Cool Cats, you all did pursue mm -hmm. in, in some capacity. Can you just talk about how that's evolved, wh why you took action, if this is the right way to phrase it, against little baby cool cats. Yeah. How, how do you think about that in general? Well, and this is obviously a conversation that will always keep coming up. Um, is like, where do you draw the line with your IP? And like I've been saying with cool cats, our IP is just so important to us, mainly the silhouette of blue cat and the traits. Like, And so with little baby cool cats, where we poorly we had an a medium article that we realized after the fact oh we did mess up we um could have made this very we could have made this clear as what we see as a derivative um and where we crossed that line was that they took our exact like trait assets and just scaled them down and to me that's just a copy and paste project that's not a derivative to me a derivative is reimagining or like redrawing everything and taking a fresh take on it. Um, and there's another 
uh, project that came out on Cool Cats at like the same time. And they were a great example of what a derivative project should look like. And they like took the idea of Cool Cats and then just made all sorts of like crazy traits outside of it that they hand drew and redid. And like, in my eyes, that's a derivative mm-hmm. project. The problem is because it's decentralized and it's Web3, we're fighting this battle of what's allowed. And um, it, it's tough because there's very much two sides of it. Um, there's a lot of people against what Cool Cats decided and there's a lot of people who are for it. And we're just trying to figure that out. And in my eyes, like, I think Cool Cats is just a little different and we can get into this more, but like, we were really the first 10K project to come out with an artist as as like one of the founders. And, uh, and it's like my life's work kind of thing. So I hold some of those things more dearly to me than something that I would have just paid an artist to do. And that was our project. It's like, I've been building this brand for a while. I put it on the blockchain. And so when I see something that's an exact copy, that's where Mm -hmm. I cross the line. And Um, what did you do? Did you, is it right to say you took action against Lil Baby Cool Cats? Or I know the DMCA, like the, did you try and delist them? Or what was sort of your your response there? We just reached out to, open C and told mm-hmm. them that they mm-hmm. had been using our assets and it yeah mainly that they were just mm-hmm. using our assets and stuff and so they got taken down and so then you know a lot of stuff had happened on Twitter and we ended up talking to them and kind of what got resolved is that we're going to leave it up to our community to decide if they want something that's a copy of the thing they own mm-hmm. or not because and that's another thing I didn't touch on was like we're also trying to protect the people who bought into our project yeah. who have spent that someone could have bought in at 10 ETH. They bought like it, it cost a lot to get this asset. And for someone just to like copy their asset and now make it cheaper, like they feel powerless when they see that happen. And so it's up to us to be the voice for for our community and to take actions in that way. And so we're working on it now, but we're creating a way that our communities can community can be the one to kind of make these decisions because ultimately, like it's their it's their decision on an individual cat by cat basis. Yeah, right. In, exactly. In that, in that way, that's interesting. It's like, are you fine with that? Because normally, you know, you you have your cool cat. You can do whatever you want with the image you own. Like, and so when someone else is doing something with your image, you're like, wait, what? This goes against everything NFTs is about. NFTs is about ownership, so, um, and that's why we did that, so. Zerion is the perfect place to view the entirety of your crypto portfolio all in one spot. Not only does Zerion aggregate all the tokens across all of your wallets, but it also displays the NFTs that you've been tirelessly collecting. Zerion even reports the value of your NFTs in your overall portfolio, giving you the most comprehensive report on the entirety of your crypto portfolio. Zerion isn't just a place to get an understanding of your portfolio, but it also hooks into DeFi activities like trading, borrowing, and lending, all in one convenient place. So you don't have to memorize all the various DeFi websites to do all of your DeFi activities. To get started, go to zerion.io slash bankless and load up your wallet or wallets into the Zerion interface and supercharge your DeFi experience and enrich your NFT lifestyle. That's Z-E-R-I-O-N slash bankless. I want to give a special thanks to overpriced JPEG partner, BlockBlock. Not only because they are a sponsor of this show, but also because they are my employer. BlockBlock is an innovative blockchain lab. We work across NFTs and the metaverse. And our goal is really to push the industry forward with every new project we take on. We founded and currently run the Nibits DAO, which just partnered with Larva Labs to create more metaverse-friendly renderings of Nibits, which is awesome. We are also partnered with a Sundance award-winning filmmaker to build the first DAO that will own a feature-length documentary film. We have a ton of cool projects down the pipeline and are really looking for cool people to partner with on this. So go to blockblock.io to subscribe to our newsletter and be kept up to date about what we have going on and also to check out open roles we have available. Would love to have you apply, come work with me, coming out, blockblock.io. I want to talk about milk slash gold, mm-hmm. which uh, first maybe just explain what they are and 
the distinction between the two yeah. uh, as something that's coming out as part of the Cool Cats project. So Milk and Gold is our token that we're offering. Um, and I know it might be confusing. You're like, wait, Cool the Cats ERC-20? is the token. Yeah, exactly. And so this is literally like a cryptocurrency, like very much. That's how you should view it. And what's cool about it, by introducing a token into your project, it offers all of these interesting like new scenarios that you can do like going back to decision making like maybe there's you know it's about how many like coins you have or something that's that's actually a lame example but there's a lot of things that you can now buy with milk and gold and the first case that it'll be used is with the the cool pets that we're coming out with um, which is like our second offering for cool cats and each cat that you own produces its own milk and so by owning a cat like we're adding utility to your cat and that it generates milk and this milk will be like i won't use that example i was gonna say your milk is like your gold and but then it gets confusing because we have gold um (laughs) but like the milk is like the you know the higher end token that the only way you can own earn it is by owning a cat or buying it from someone who owns a cat and so that creates this whole other market within our project and like um, that just adds to everything and, that we can do. And there's an expectation I'm imagining that milk will be available on Uniswap and will itself become a token that has an right. economy and gets yep. traded. Mm-hmm. I mean, people refer to these and there's mixed feelings about it, but I'll, I'll say it and see a reaction of like it's a passive income stream essentially as part of right. this project. It, I think CyberKongs is kind of is. Yeah. It's the Cyber one Kongs that originated the, this with banana mm-hmm. tokens. And of course, now people can make $270,000 a year right. off of the passive income just by owning a CyberKong. Right. And like kind of taking it back a little bit, that's why you invest in projects early is like, oh, I minted a cat for 50 bucks and I've held it for this long, believed in the project. Now they're releasing gold and I get passive income through this. And you can choose to sell it or not. You know that's on the user. Um, but we have use cases for the milk. Like, if you want to upgrade your egg, um, and a little context. Egg is part of the pet. Egg, egg is part of the pet, and for every one cat that you, for one cat, you get one egg. So you own twenty cats, you get twenty eggs, and each ca- each one of those cats is also generating milk. And so, with the milk, you're buying items to then feed to your pet. And your pet will slowly grow up until Mm -hmm. it gets to the last stage and turns into like an elemental creature or like pet. We used to call them creatures, but they're pets now. Uh, um, So that's kind of the use case for the milk. And then we're going to have different ways that you can use your milk in relation to your, um, your pet. And then gold comes in for the people who don't own a cat. And they, we still want this other currency getting generated. So like, you go on a quest or you do like some event that we're doing and you get like plus 100 gold. That's just a number I'm throwing out there. And so we're great. We have these two currencies that will work in tandem with each other and kind of feed into our ecosystem. Or you're just trying to play the crypto game and like, you know, you want to play the market with that. So it's really on the user. So is it safe to say, is this publicly said or not that, You've mentioned you're trying to build out potentially games with cool cats or a kind of mm-hmm. a gaming type e- ecosystem and milk and gold would function as like in-game currencies within right. that, hypothetically That's, speaking. I forget what we've said publicly, but basically, yeah, like it's going to be a an in-game currency for this whole pet offering and further the, like you know that's just step one is pets and so the but. reason i find that interesting is because one of the concerns i think around these again call them passive income streams and, and i think with like cyber Kongs in particular is it can feel like there's this circularity there where if i'm not mistaken banana which is cyber mm-hmm. Kong's coin can really only be spent for breeding and mm-hmm. you breed kind of new generation kongs but so each thing just props up the value of the, you know, like the only reason banana right. is worth anything is because Kongs are worth anything, but Kongs are worth what they're worth because banana right. is worth what they're worth. And there's kind of a, a scary, it feels like a little fragile to have an ecosystem yeah. that that's circular. Yeah. I think it's it's much more interesting if if there is a game component, like if if, mm-hmm. if this is for more than just 
you know, money. kind of this, this, it's, yeah, this, this yeah. circular process. I think that, um, that's a much more interesting way to probably explore yeah. this concept. And we're so excited. Like we're coming out with the beta test this, this Friday. Um, and people will get to test out this whole system because it's tricky. Like it's not that easy to just be like, Oh, we're adding a currency and that's it. Um, there's like, obviously there's legal stuff you have to go through and then there's balancing so that no, someone doesn't just get dropped like a bunch of money and you're like, wait, why did that happen? So, um, it's crazy. Are you dealing right now with lawyers with questions of like, is this a security or, you know, you feel comfortable that you're on the, you're on the non-security side of this oh, no, these we, other projects. Have been. We're definitely getting help with all this because yeah. you don't want to, like, you really kind of only have one shot to go live with it because the second your currency's out there you don't want it to flood the market and now yeah. there's no value behind it so um or you do yeah you just make a misstep so we're definitely talking to people it is a longer process than we first imagined but we're taking the right steps to make sure when it goes live it's picture perfect i want to talk about your advice for artists and up and coming okay. artists or, you know, in the NFT space. Otherwise, I'm sure you get artists who come up to you all the time and are like, I want your life now. Or I, you know, <laughs> Give like, me advice. Uh, yeah. Like, what what, you do, do you have, you know, one main or a couple main big pieces of advice for artists in this space, particularly in this space? Yeah, because sometimes I just try to convince artists who are outside of the space to get in it and they just shut me down. <laughs> it glaze like, over. Yeah, they're like, eh, you've you've said too many words. <laughs> And I get it because I went to <laughs> and, art and too school. many of them involve blockchain, and I'm blockchain. like officially. <laughs> I heard decentralized somewhere in there. But for artists in the space, um, I personally think making a brand of yourself as an artist goes a really long way. Because, mm -hmm. like, obviously, what you as an artist, whatever you do, you're attaching like whatever project you're on is also attached to you. So, like, I'd mentioned earlier. Um, I'm pretty sure Cool Cats was really the first 10K project to come out with an artist behind it. And no one had really seen that. It was mostly people like hiring artists to, to make their work. And so um, just being the voice of the work that you're making goes a long way. And um, people really like to connect to the artist. And so that's why like getting on Twitter spaces, just having good content on Twitter, like it's tough for people just to find you. I've been there for, for many, many years and people unfortunately don't just find you if you're not doing anything. You have to kind of be vocal. Um, and of course, like, can they relate to you? People are gonna relate to artists they like and there's plenty of people in the space who don't relate to me, but then there's people who love uh, video games and watching anime or like being a degen on the internet and like, those are things they relate with. And they're like, oh, I like this artist. I like their work. Like, I feel that connection. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's going to keep people around is forming that connection. Um, and so cause I just know I, I've been there as well, but I've seen a lot of artists who kind of stick their nose up a little bit and think that, you know, their work will speak for itself. And maybe it will. Maybe it will. But um, I think making a brand of yourself helps out a lot. Yeah, I, I saw something recently, and I think that was like Picasso was one of the only painters who actually was famous while he he was still alive, or like one of the only yeah. artists. Like, right. you might be a genius, but assume <laughs> that other people aren't going to pick up on your genius, and yeah. that unfortunately you still need to, you know, yeah. uh, market yourself in in a way. Well, right. What I heard yeah, yeah. you saying there, it felt like was a was a note about authenticity. So you're mm -hmm. like some people won't relate to me. And I think that's actually a critical piece of this is like to build a brand and to build a, whether it's a personal brand or a art brand or whatever that people love and strongly relate to the way they do something like Cool Cats, you inevitably have to have people who don't relate to you. Like if right. you're appealing to everybody, you're not going to have diehards. You're not going to make it. <laughs> that's, like, that's sort of it, not the way it works. And so no. – being really authentic to who you are means you'll you'll find your tribe. Is it, I think what you, what I hear you absolutely describing no, there. You synthesize that perfectly. Like you have to find your tribe. You're not going to appeal to everyone. Like it's just an unrealistic view. You kind of have to find your niche and then like stay within that, and then that will grow. You know, if people like relate to it or whatever. But you know, how important like I said, do you think? 
Sorry, finish that. No, I was just going to say, like I said, I'm just trying to ride that cute and cool scale. (laughs) That's like the sphere I'm in. And and staying lighthearted and just goofy. Like, I'm not trying to take it seriously. How important do you think networking is in this space? It feels like kind of a, not a dirty word, but we think about like in finance, you want to network. And this space, it feels like not cool to be like all business networking. But I I think it's important for people to... to realize it, it might be important. I don't know if you want to say uh, any words on that. But. Oh, it's it's very important. Like, networking is huge. Some of the contacts that we got, like um, our first collab with Ghost. And Ghost, is a, for people who don't know, is a very big artist in the space. And I, he had actually reached out to me, and I didn't know who he was at first, and I forgot to get back to him. And then... You know, I'm in the space like a week later and I'm hearing people talk about this ghost person. I like buy their piece because I like it. And then because of that, he messaged me again and we started networking that way. And like, that's the reason we ended up collabing with each other is because we networked and we started talking and that like, be, be a good person as well. Like, you know, don't be full of yourself because... At the end of the day, we're all friends at, in this. That's how I view it. And like a lot of the people we've collaborated with, I've had a, a great conversation with. Um, and you're just creating these bonds that get tighter and tighter um, because we're in a lucky uh, time in the NFTs right now where the space is still so small that you can make a lot of friends with a lot of people in the space and propel each other up. And um there's a reason we say we're going to make it like we're mm. all in this together. Let's help each other out. Like, oh, Bored Apes just did something amazing. Well, that's good for all of us. Like, it's just Jimmy Fallon bought a Bored Ape. That's amazing for all of us. That's just validating the space. And so um, networking is there, huge. Do you think there are any main or major pitfalls uh, that you see artists in this space fall into? Or that you'd warn against? Don't defend yourself too hard. The internet can be rough. Um, and it can be easy to see a comment on Twitter talking about your project. That some guy out there is like, oh, not going to make it. And like, don't let that get you down. Um, just keep striving with the community that you have. Or you know, things like that. It's just because it's so ingrained on the internet, we have a lot of strong personalities who sit behind their computer and I've seen some artists get defensive when they get in that situation and it can end up harming them because it's just mm. not a good look, you know. Mm. Um, mm. And that's maybe a specific use case, but I have seen it and it's unfortunate. Um, so you have to pick your battles <laughs> or just like brush things off and keep showing people why you're amazing. I want to close by talking a little bit about the industry as a whole. You mentioned buying a uh, one of Ghost's artwork. Yeah. I'm curious, like, are you still somebody who shops in the space? Do you, you know, oh, do yeah. you, are you still like an NFT degen? Do you have any projects right now that you're super into that you want to call out? Like, what oh, are you I'll buying these out. days? Yeah. Okay, go, do and, it. And so recently, um, shout out to Doug, the artist of Toy Boogers. And mm. Toy Boogers just came out. Um, and I, it's funny, I bought into the project without doing my research, which is a no-no. I recommend everyone do your own research but luckily it was a good bet um i their their collection is so fun and minting it gave me the exact feeling i got minting cool cats of like you you click the button to mint and the thing you saw you instantly fell in love with and it was just this like wacky combination like like cool cats you have like a knight helmet with ninja like crying or something stupid i don't know and so with toy boogers, it's like, like it's wearing a donut head with a squid body, like riding a skateboard, and it's so lighthearted and fun. And that's why it, what really let like uh, pushed me towards it. But then what me what really like solidified that for me was meeting the artist and like understanding their process. That they weren't really like an artist in the space. Like they just mm. liked to draw, and so they like hand drew every asset and then like changed it into vector so it was digital and then just started piecing all 3,333 of them 
by hand. So they Whereas, didn't have a dev like coding nope. the gener. Oh my yeah, gosh. No, they put each single one of them together. And to me, that was like, this person wanted it. They didn't have the right tools to just like give it to a dev and make it happen. They wanted it. They That was dedication right there. And so that's what ended up like, I was already sold on the project, but that drove the nail through the coffin. How did you uh, find them? How did you find this project? So another, like what I love about the community, it was a Cool Cats uh, community member who's been in there since day one. And they reached out to me and were like, hey, I'm on this project of this artist who's doing, you know, toy boogers. And I only saw like two of what they looked like. And I was like, oh, cool. Like, I get it, and I like I had different ideas of what it was, and then I looked at their collection like as a whole, and I was like, oh my gosh, these are so much fun. They all seem so unique and different, um, and so I minted three of them, forgot about it all day, got on Twitter, and their their Twitter page was like, oh, Klon got one, and it was <laughs> like, I'm so happy, blah blah blah, and then. Uh, people reached out and were like, you got a rare one, by the way, and I'm like, wait, wait, let me look at all these and. Uh, it was just so much fun to see yeah. them. And I got so excited, I minted like six more on the spot. I was like, I want more of these. I had so much fun. And so then I was spending all this time in their Discord just chatting away. Um, and like, well, I think that's a great example of the networking we're talking about, where exactly. like because this person had been in your community for a long time, had yeah. been active, had like had had built a name for themselves as a community member there, they were able to get access to you where somebody who's just trying to like shill you a one-off is, is yes. not going to connect yes. in that way. So like, yes. you know, yeah. and I'm not an artist in this space, but I do have artists ask me because I talk about this space, like how do I get into it? And, and I'm like, take time. Like if you're not already in the community, I mean, make your art all along, right. but like it, maybe it takes a year, but like, I, you know, hopefully less, this moves, space moves really fast, but correct. Immerse yourself, be in these discords, be mm -hmm. an active giving community member to other people's projects. Yeah. And that feels like the best way to have it fed back to you if you launch absolutely own. yeah discord That's is a great a space example. to get even closer to people like twitter there's a little bit of a wall because it's all mm -hmm. social media but discord you get to like have these conversations like i just talked to the artists right away like because they're in their discord um and so that's how you network and i agree like because i knew this person through cool cats I was willing to give them the extra bit of like few seconds to be like, oh, let me actually look at your project. Yeah. This isn't just you shilling to me, like you said, because um, you get a lot of that and it gets it gets that. taxing. And you're just like, then you start to shut people down, which is unfortunate because I don't want to be that way. But it's like, I can't just look at I can't buy only so many hours in the day, only so many hours, so much ease. Yeah. Like I can't just do yeah. it all. So, yeah. Do you think the PFP market is oversaturated today? I do. I do. I do it. Uh, and I'm really waiting for what's next in, in blockchain and Web3. Um, it's You mentioned that earlier. What do you think that is? Like, this is this was, this is a I big question know. I had for you. Gamifying. Like, yeah. I, I guess kind of like what games, because it's already like what a lot of these people already do is game. And mm -hmm. so, but it works well with Web3. Um, I really want to see more musicians in the space. I want to see more people um, using the idea of what an NFT is. I've seen people use it as a ticket for something. So like I recently just bought a ticket for someone who's going to go put my cat on a mural somewhere because that was what they were offering. They're like, hey, if you buy one of these seven tickets, I'm painting this mural in this place and you can be a part of that if you've gotten a ticket. And so, like, there's cool things like that that you can do with tokenizing an asset that, like, has a receipt behind it, has, you know, you can see the transaction. That's what's so beautiful about the blockchain. Everything is transparent. Um, and so I'm really interested to see where people take this and go. I think we're in this stage of PFP projects because it's easier um, and we've seen it done so many times. Like, obviously, Cool Cats was not the first one to do it. Um, Bored Apes was not the first one to do it. Uh, CryptoPunks kind of was. And so they started that idea, and then you saw all these personalities coming out, people forming a brand behind their PFP. And it gets to the point where people have already made their brand, so they don't want another PFP to represent them. And that's why mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to last too much yeah. longer. Um, unfortunately. 
I was going to ask where you you think the biggest opportunities for innovating are, you know, yeah. given that. But it sounds like you kind of referenced some just now. I mean, obviously, gaming musicians. Yeah. It sounds like you're saying. Do you have any others where you're like, here here's a gap I see that if I didn't have all of my time locked up in Cool Cats, <laughs> uh, I might be taking advantage of. I want to see someone who really ties their NFT into the real world, um, mm. if that makes sense. Like. Like a Pokemon uh, Go, but it's yeah, uh, you're and like, going and finding NFTs. I think, I think yeah, that kind something of an idea, like, but. and I, that comes back to gamifying it. So that's yeah, why that's I true. say gamifying is just a blanket term of like, how do you make it even more interactive? Because the biggest thing, the biggest selling point behind an NFT is, is what's the utility? Um, because if there's no utility, they have to like the art, and if the art's not good, then no one's gonna buy it. So. Um, yeah, it's tough. I, I'm so curious, like s- people smarter than me are going to figure it out or, uh, or cool cats will, will hopefully set a, uh, pave the way, pave the way or hoping. <laughs> okay. Final question. I'm curious, like what does a day in your life look like now after oh. launching cool cats? Like what is like an NFT superstar artist do a day? <laughs> it's not as glorious as some people might think. It's a lot of talking. Um, and it's funny cause I, I through cool cats, I've gotten better, but I was not a talker before. I didn't like, uh, well, you're doing got, great. Yeah. Thank you. Cause <laughs> I get really nervous inside. I did a, an interview where I had to go like be in front of a camera and do that. And that was like, I essentially like, in my in my head, I like blacked out and I was like, couldn't remember what I said. But they're all like, "You did great! Like that was awesome! Like cool!" Because I don't remember. But to go back to your question of what's a day in the life, like if I just literally tell you, like <laughs> I wake up and I have to wake up around like I wake up at six and then get at my computer at like seven. You're an early bird. I was luckily always an early bird, but because of this. Um, we have people who live in the UK. We have people who live, you know, in Asia. Like, there's so many time zones, but mainly the UK because they're on our t- uh, the founders. I had to shift my whole schedule to, like, work with that um, because I wake up and, th- like, I wake up to a bunch of notifications because I'm the last one to wake up. And so I first wake up. Go through all of that. Make sure I'm good. I'm the worst at responding to people. That means Discord, I assume. Discord and DMs and things. Discord, Twitter, uh, Slack to talk to the team. And it's just a whole thing. But then, you know, we have a team meeting where the founders get together. We talk about what we want to do for the week or the day, whatever, where we're at. Um, and then I get to do some drawing if I have some time. Um and it's weird. I'm, I'm drawing like less <laughs> sometimes because I have to talk more and like put myself out there. Network, like we talked about, um, it's at that stage where you just want to keep networking. You know, you have the project, um, and then mainly just either yeah, like draw or talk. Get on Twitter Spaces. Be active on Twitter. Make sure people know you're still alive. Um, and then you do t- Twitch streams where oh, you. Oh, I'm you doing one today. Do yeah. art. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that was an idea that started before launch. And we were like, hey, let's make Cool Cat assets with people. And so some of the the assets you see were drawn on the Twitch stream. And so I've kept that going every Wednesday. Um, So I'll do one today. And it's just a nice way to connect to the audience even more. Just like making that community bond even closer. They get to see that like, oh, I see Klon's process as he draws. Last week, I did a, a tutorial video explaining how to do a generative project from scratch. Um, and so things like that, people really respond to. And, you know, just education. So I do all that, I get my work done. And then uh, my best friend who lives in Georgia, we have a, like a cutoff point where we like to play video games together. And I just disconnect from reality. Just play some video games and then usually like eat dinner and then draw a little bit more at night. Just like doodle on my iPad. So that's the day in the life. <laughs> Beautiful. It sounds yeah. like a good life, man. That's that's great. It's crazy. Um, yeah. <laughs> 
Well, thank you so much for all this insight for coming on. This was great. I'm, I'm sure people are going to love it and, and just getting to know you even further. And I've thoroughly enjoyed getting to know you more. And what's the the phrase, the Cool Cats community? You guys say, we like the we cats. We like the cats. Like, we love the cats. We like yeah. the cats, baby. We like the cats. <laughs> so what can I say? Oh, what's my pitch to when we're talking to companies? Well, simple. <laughs> we like the cats. Um, <laughs> boom. Sold. Sold. <laughs> yeah. We hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.